Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. Welcome to your Partner in Success Radio. I'm your host, Denise Griffiths, and today I get to welcome virtual CFO Megan Dolly to the show. Megan wants to help you get your mind off your money and back in your business. You want to be in control of your business, and that's why she's here to discuss just how you can get control of your numbers, and those numbers are so important. And sadly, it's something that many of us, when we're first starting out, we just don't even pay attention to it. We're too busy taking care of everything, including cleaning the bathroom. It's kind of sad. So light bulb moments are Megan's favorite thing, and she'll tell you this. So when clients finally see what the numbers mean, it's like watching a video where those colorblind people put on those glasses. We've all seen them, and we all get a little teary-eyed. And you, you as a business owner can see color for the first time. You can see your numbers for the first time. And she says it's magical. So Megan is here to share several really important points. Office, offense versus defense in business. And the question, what do I need to know? And then how a business owners can actually use it. And she says that cash forecasts help you sleep at night. We will discuss her favorite values, creativity, grace, and courage, and then we're going to get to the other half of goal setting. Megan, good morning. Welcome to your Partner in Success Radio. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much. This is really fun already. <laughs> well, you know, my voice is, is crapping out. Just It has been. Just it, <laughs> And I'll tell you all why, because we've had, I live in southwest Louisiana, we've had four named hurricanes barrel straight at us the last two literally showed up on my doorstep i'm not kidding so with that kind of weather magnificent as a lot of it can be to just once you and people think i'm nuts but once you've done everything you can do offense versus defense like we just mentioned you might as well sit back and enjoy them because they're magnificent scary but magnificent yeah the other part of that is they churn up all kinds of garbage that comes in from the Gulf. It's churning up from the ground because of the mud and the flooding. So my voice is going to be a little rocky. I'm just going to, you know, give myself a break right now. So that's what why I sound the way I do. So <laughs> Megan, Megan, it's so good to have you here because numbers, they're, they're so important. And I do want to ask you, why do so many of us, and my hand's up in the air, I did it myself in the beginning, I just didn't even look at my numbers. I was so busy doing every stinking thing, which most solopreneurs, entrepreneurs do. We have to do it ourselves. So is there, right. how can you help people like me who, you know, we get to the point where we're like, well, crud, that was stupid. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I think, I think at some point, you know, we're always taught that math class is hard or math class is boring or, or whatever that early message is. And then as we get into our businesses, we're like, as long as my revenue is fine, I don't really have to look. Like if this is mm-hmm. a scary thing where essentially people, they don't, even if they do their numbers, they don't know if they're doing it right. And so they have this feedback loop of, okay, even if I sit down and do my numbers, which I don't like to do in the first place, it's not going to be useful because I'm probably not doing it right anyway, right? We have this image of this being hard or complicated and, ugh, you know what? I'm just going to go sell more stuff so I don't have to look at the numbers. Been there, done that. I'm so glad we're talking about this because my numbers, I thought were fine. Turns out not so much. Yeah, it can be quite revealing when we get our head, like, I don't want to say in the sand because that makes it feel like we're willfully, I'm doing this to myself on purpose, I'm not going to look, where in reality it's more of an avoidance issue because we we do want them to be right. We do want them to be useful, but it's a really high and hard mountain to climb all by yourself. It is, and something you said really kind of made me chuckle when you're talking about, you know, math is hard and math is boring. Listen, I went back to to school to get a computer science degree, back to college when I was a little bit older, 
And I was rocking along. I had a 4.0 and I hit algebra. Oh, my God. Listen, I am confu- I'm convinced, convinced that they just gave me a pass to get me out of there because I was pretty vocal about how much I thought algebra was a made-up bunch of nonsense that some guy who could not get a date and was living in a cave <laughs> with, with a candle made up because he had nothing better to do. Changed my mind. Seriously, changed my mind about math. <laughs> Oh, man, I see. I love algebra. And I think oh. I got really, really lucky when I was growing up. I mean, like, seriously lucky when it comes to the teachers that I had and how math was in my life in a, at a very early age, in a way that um, it was this approachable, friendly, fun thing that was more like a, a challenging puzzle to grasp and like conquer and woohoo in, in, in small enough steps that I was able to digest it and, and really understand it and see it in my brain as like blobs and shapes and colors instead of digits and symbols on oh. a piece of paper. So, so, so you were seeing it in, was, in images. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. so I can see that like sense. these, these shapes and things and how they relate to each other. And so when it comes to these, long, complicated, confusing lines on a paper, um, in my creative brain, that easily translates. And I know that is not how it works for most people. Um, So what I do is I take these things that seem intimidating, even terms in in the accounting world, like depreciation, EBITDA, you know, revenue, gross profit. It (laughs) is not helpful. It's not helpful. We need terms that we can understand and grasp and are meaningful for us. And so to take this jargon over here and translate it into something that is understandable and useful, that's where the magic comes in. And I'm so glad to hear you say that because I understand to agree what you're talking about. I do the same thing with web development. For somebody who cannot master math, never have, probably never will, I understand coding. Go figure. So there's a mental block in there somewhere. And I can see when I'm building a website, not even on paper, it's in my head. I've built it and launched it in my head before I ever hit my keyboard. Sounds like you do something very similar. Yes, yes. So ultimately, I know where I want my clients to go. I know what I they need to see in order to start making really good business decisions and seeing what's coming down the road um, and predicting the future because that's really what helps people sleep at night is knowing what is coming in the next couple of months at the at the least. And so once I understand what they need to be able to see, what they need to be able to understand. Um, in order to sleep at night, now I can build something for them that they can understand in their own particular language. Okay, so Megan, when you first start working with somebody, let's just go with, with what you do because that's probably going to be the easiest for us to understand. So let's just say that I'm coming to you as a client and I'm just, you know, I'm brilliant at darn near everything but that. And that, that's the truth. I'm not even lying about that. I just, it's not, it's not where I'm really strong. My sister, oh my gosh, I'm like, help. And she just says, okay, I'll be this one. <laughs> Me, not so much. But what, let's just say I'm coming to you and I don't have a clue. Where would you ask me to start? It sounds to me like you're very good at calming people down and getting us to think and, and you know, go in a linear fashion. So what would the linear trail be that I would have to follow? Okay. So the first thing I do is I try to figure out exactly where my clients are in my own mind of, um, do they have their numbers organized? If so, do they understand what those numbers are saying? And if they understand it, are they able to use it? Um, so most of my clients, when they come to me, just like you said, like they feel comfortable. That's my number one mission. That's the first thing mm-hmm. that they need to feel is comfortable because there's a lot of um, fear, sometimes shame, sometimes embarrassment. It's like taking off your clothes in front of a stranger for a lot of people. And so I want them to be as comfortable. I've seen everything. It's like walking into a doctor and they ask you to drop trial. And I'm like, I've seen it a jillion times. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Right. And so to get them to um, feel comfortable showing me everything that they have, 
even if it's just a pile of bank statements, even if it's only a spreadsheet. I just want to know where are you at right now and what do you have um, and what's the fastest way that we can get some, some information out of this so I can see the patterns in your business, so I can, I can show you what those patterns are. Um, and so the side of business that I work on you mentioned this earlier, is like the offense versus defense. And you, you're very good at the offense side of business. What that means is like all of the stuff that, that goes into generating the, the sales, making products that people love, making sure that your clients are well taken care of and they're getting exactly what they came for. And the defense side has more to do with the numbers and the digits in the, in the okay, now that we have the data, what do we do with it? How do we use this to make sure that we're holding on to as much of that cash as we can that's coming through the door? Um, so like in a football game, running up the score is great and all. You need that score in order to win the game, but you can't win the game if you, every time your opponents go on the field, they're running up the score just as much, if not higher. So on the defense, once that score is, is going up, Let's make sure that it's staying up and it's not the, the, it's not leaking out of the business. And see, that makes sense. So do you have, and I wondered what offense versus defense meant when I, when I wrote this down. I said, I know I need to ask this. I'm not sure what I'm asking, so I'm so glad you explained that. So do you have any, I don't know, do you have a case study that you can share where, Somebody did exactly, you know, what you're talking about. All they had was a pile of bank accounts, bank, bank statements. I mean, how do you help uh, someone? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I actually then take a tool that I've created just in an Excel sheet. And um, if that's where we're starting is just with bank statements, certainly it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, but in that case, what I'm doing is I'm looking at how much is coming in and how much is going out. And what are the trends? Like, is your coming in growing faster than what's going out? Is what's going out growing faster than what's coming in? Um, and then once we can identify some trends there, I want to know what's making up the changes month over month. Like, is it a particular type of sale that's coming in more? Is it a particular type of um, – a lot of times when people get desperate, they start spending more, and I want to know where their, where their um, desperation lies, right? Like, are they trying to spend a bunch on marketing things that aren't working? What kind of spaghetti are they throwing against the wall? Um, and where are their wins? That's really important, too. Like, what are they, what are they really good at? And um, that can be revealed in the bank statements really well. I mean, Obviously, I would love to have this information in an organized fashion that's in like QuickBooks or something like that, but that's not everybody's strong suit. And I get that. That's why I'm here. <laughs> um, so, yeah, even if we're just going off bank statements and credit card statements and maybe PayPal or a Stripe account, um, bring it on. Bring it on. We need to start somewhere, and congratulations to those who, who do. So I'll give you the example. You asked for a case study. Um, I just worked with a client on Wednesday, and he came in quite nervous because he's like, look, you know, um, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life, and, and I, I've never told anybody this, and I just, I just need you to see what I've done to myself, but what I've also been able to do in the past year to pull myself up by the bootstraps. So he, he had some wins over the last year, which was fantastic. Mm. He just wanted to know how long – his history was going to haunt him and what he could do about it right now. Um, no, he wasn't organized in any fashion, but we did have his statement. So really the first step, the most, the most basic step that I could help him get some really quick serenity around what was coming for him in the next couple months was to show him exactly where he, his trends were showing that he was going to be in 90 days. And once he saw that, like the ideas just started flowing. He was like, okay, great. I know that. Okay. So next week I can do X, Y, and Z, and that'll bring that number to that. And that's exactly what I need to get me into November. And then in November, um, so I already have that, I already have that platform of revenue and I just need to grow it by two more clients. And I actually have two people in my email. And so 
once he's able to see what needs to be done, he was like, oh, yeah, I have some of this lined up. And he was able to get really excited. And now he knew exactly what to work on within the next two weeks. And I see where he went with that because once you can take, look, our brains, we're constantly dumping on our brains. And these days there's just more and more and more to worry about if you allow yourself to worry about it. Some, look, I firmly believe that unless it is something that I can directly impact and change, I don't really let it bother me too much. There's a lot of things I can't do a darn thing about. So I tend to concern myself and worry myself about things that I can impact. But that being said, and I know I sounded very tough there. That being said, if my brain is busy going, oh, geez, oh, geez, oh, geez, oh, crap, then I can't really impact what I know because I'm too busy worrying about something that I should be impacting, but I haven't identified it yet. And I do this all the time. We all do this. This is not just me picking on myself. We all do this. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I mean, part of that, what you said, like it doesn't impact you as much, that comes with maturity. And that's certainly something that I've been learning and had to re- have had to relearn over and over. And I'm still trying to learn it. Um, but when we have that icky feeling in our stomach that we just can't quite pinpoint what it comes from, being able to just sit down and reflect on what's coming and see what's coming and say, okay, What's step one? What do I need to do in the next 15 minutes? What do I need to do by the end of today? That, that starts calming that ugh, ugh, feeling that's sitting in, the, in our gut like this black rock. And that, that it impacts you. Like, you know, we, when you've got something that's in the back of your mind or it's somewhere, but you know it's there and it's bugging you, you may, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe you haven't identified it yet, it slows you down. And then after a while, you notice yeah. that your head hurts, your back hurts, you know, you want to kick something. I go outside and kick my tires every now and then. I mean, sometimes <laughs> you just got to, you know, did it help me? No, but it felt good. <laughs> you know, but But the thing is, we have to have that picture and I had a just I had a great question just pop up in the chat room um I don't know if this is a male or female it doesn't matter but the question is I think my numbers are pretty good I'm clocking along pretty good I'm paying my bills but here's a big question everything is run out of my personal bank account am I going to get yelled at by Megan (laughs) so take it (laughs) no Nope, I don't yell at my clients. In fact, sometimes they're so harsh on themselves. And I'm like, hang on a second. That's my client you're talking about. You're not allowed to talk to her like that. <laughs> always, I always start with where my clients are at. And that's just, grace is really important to me um, to be able to, especially people that I don't necessarily get along with or agree with, but just if I can grant them some grace and grant myself some grace, um, it's been a real game changer. So, you know, no, nobody's going to yell at you for that. Um, There's certainly some liability that you're opening yourself up to when you run your business like that. Um, But it comes down to, is it working for you now? And do you have bigger fires to put out? that's okay. Go put out those fires. We will get this taken care of when it needs to be taken care of. And that's a great answer. So basically your tool that you mentioned, you can take, and I'm assuming that you would have to take all of these, this stack of uh, personal bank accounts and sort out what's personal and what's business, but it shouldn't be that difficult, right? Right, right. We should be able to go through and clean that up. And, you know, it's not necessarily that we have to go back to the beginning of your business and clean it all up or whatever it may be. I'm sure your tax person has done something, you know, to get you through like end of 2019 or if you haven't filed 2019, 2018. So it's more of, um, in my perspective, I just want to know what your current trends are. I want to know exactly why you are where you're, you are today with your business. How did you get here? What have you tried? What has worked? What hasn't worked? Um, and I only need to go far enough back to find the answer to that. The trends, you mean? Yes. Yep, the trends. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so so what happens, and you mentioned something that really kind of grabbed my attention because a lot of people, look, I, I'm a digital agency, so I see people throwing spaghetti all the time. And, you know, I kind of, you know, I go into Sherlock Holmes mode, you know, why are you doing this? Did this work? And I do a lot of what you're doing, just not necessarily with the numbers. I want to know what the results were. And 
I, I'll tell you honestly, Megan, I spend a lot of time walking people back from the ledge. You know, copywriters have a lot to be ashamed of, and some of them are so good. They're terrific, <laughs> and, but it's like, come on, <laughs> really? And I'll tell people, listen, what have you already done? What are you doing now? Did it work? Well, why would you want to buy another course or another tool that basically does what the last guy did? I mean, have you thought about this? I'm telling you, ledge walking backwards all the time. Yeah, I think um, everybody wants, and I'm not immune to this, but everybody wants that. Neither am I. Fix. That's why I mentioned Want, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's why I blame copywriters. It's not that I don't have a lack of willpower. It's their fault. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, certainly, certainly. And sometimes it's the case yeah. that we don't give them, you know, the program enough time to work. But a lot yeah. of times is that we don't trust ourselves with what the answer might be for us in particular. And so everybody oh. has this rigid program that like, this has worked for me and has worked for 90% of my clients. Well, maybe what about the other 10%? You know, what is it in that we can get curious about in our own business? And instead of trying to do and replicate what everybody else is doing, because really, where is the fun in that? Where can we get curious and creative in our own businesses? And, and sometimes it's better to make your own path and to find a way to do it cheaper or to maybe finish the courses that you already have in your library. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, sometimes, I don't know about you, Megan, but I learn best by breaking something, by making a mistake and going back and going, hmm, what the heck did I do there? Oh, I see where it went wrong. Okay, let's not do that again. Or, or let's do it again, but do it in a different kind of a way. So I love the, the fact yes. that you said curiosity. I love that because that's how I operate. I'm intensely curious. I want to see how it works. I want to break it. And then I want to reassemble it to suit me. Yes. And you know what you need there when you break things? Because sometimes people break things and they get really hard on themselves. You need grace. <laughs> you need the grace to forgive yourself or even celebrate that you broke it and figured out what didn't work um, and to move on and do it again a different way with the same enthusiasm and the same anticipation of, ooh, what's this going to do? What's, what's the outcome going to be here? Um, I, I love that. I love grace. I love curiosity. And breaking things is part of that. And um, reflection, being able to reflect and go back and uh, I don't know about you, Denise, but I give myself time in the morning to just sit, no electronics, to just sit, give myself a question about my business that I kind of want an answer to. And sometimes the answer doesn't come that day. Sometimes it takes a week or a month even to come. Um, but just give myself a singular question to ruminate on and then give myself the space like no distractions, just to sit in my brain and let it let it stew for a while. I do something very similar, and people who listen to me on this podcast know that I do this. So if you've heard it, sorry, I'm going to say it again. Mm -hmm. But just before I go to sleep, I don't sleep well, so sleeping is a tricky prospect for me. But just at that moment where I know I'm actually going to go to sleep, I'm not going to keep reading or I'm not going to keep listening to the ceiling fan, whatever it is that's distracting me, <clears throat> excuse me, I will turn over, I may have a sticky issue that might be a web development thing. It may just be a personal question. It could be anything. And I will take that single question, that single issue, and I will turn it literally over to my subconscious for review. And then I fall asleep. And at 318, I promise you, this happens every single time. 318 in the morning, I wake up and I have the answer or a partial answer. Mm -hmm. I've at least got a, a path to follow. So in the morning when I wake up, and I, you know, I will grab my notepad and I'll write it down and go back to sleep, hope, hopefully. And then in the morning, I do something very similar. You know, I, I don't jump out of bed anymore. My mom used to say, you know, I would open my eyes and the devil would say, oh, crap, she's awake. I used to hit the floor <laughs> running. <laughs> My mom knew me well. <laughs> but, you know, it's just now I, I deliberately, and I had to train myself to do this because, you know, I'm a, 
I'm an A-type personality. I'm always go, 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 go. And I'm always thinking, fixing, breaking. I'm always doing something. But I've had to train myself to keep my butt in bed and be grateful. And, you know, look around and just be grateful and express that gratitude. And then think about the things that I either turned over to my subconscious or answers that I've already gotten, you know, from whoever downloads those things into my head. And then off I go. Sounds like you do something very similar. Yeah, I like that. I really like that. Um, you know, I have a friend that wakes up at about 3.15 every morning. I wonder if there's something special about that particular time. I don't know, but I know several friends know they can call me at 3.18. I'm awake. I'm wide awake. <laughs> so, and I've gotten texts at 3.18. Are you awake? Yes. It's like they're testing me. Yes, I'm awake. <laughs> I hope they're not waiting and just staying up all night just for that one little test. <laughs> no, I think all my friends are as nuts as I am. They're probably doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah, we oh, all we all find our friends. I'm telling you, we all find our own tribe, right? We find what if they say yeah. water seeks its own level? You ought to meet some of my friends. We're all nuts. <laughs> and if you're listen, if you're awake at three eighteen, send me an email. I'll probably respond to it. Okay, so <laughs> You, we talked a lot about grace, but you talk about creativity and courage. Let's let's cover your values because without values, it's it's hard to have a functioning business. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's hard to have a functioning life. Oh yes, you know, um, and I didn't really take the time to nail down exactly what it was that was driving me for until probably about two years ago. And it was really changing for my business because immediately all of a sudden um, I could identify when it was absent and what that, that pit in my stomach was doing, like, hang on a second, there's something that's not, not going right. And then I could also find the people that were, that were, um, really good at these things or seeking these things and make them part of my tribe or become part of their tribe, uh, if you will. And um, man, man, I started meeting really, really cool people. These three values in particular stand out just because uh, grace, like number one, grace. Um, I was not a person to either give myself or anyone around me grace for quite some time. Um, and being able to finally find that the, the, the thing missing, the thing that was causing me so much anger and like, uh, judgment of other people and like this blame, this, ugh, I can't even start to describe this black blobby, ugh, that comes with a lack of grace. When I was finally able to say, oh, grace. And then it was like this, this light was shined in my life. And I was, you know, sure, people cut me off. But you know what, maybe they're having a bad day, maybe they really need to get where they're getting there's something very important and heavy on their heart. So instead of being like, Oh, that's affecting me, why, why? Ugh, it's about me. Instead, it was, thank you for this opportunity to show somebody else some love, to just give them a little bit of room that maybe nobody else is giving them, give them a little bit of of light and love that they're probably not getting anywhere else. So um, that's why I don't, I don't like blaming my clients for anything. I don't want them to feel this heavy nastiness when it's time to, they, they get the courage to finally take a look to finally raise their hand and say, yep, I need some help with this. Um, There's no other response that I can come up with to face their courage when they're doing something so brave like that. The only right response is grace. I agree with you. Sometimes, though, you have to be sardonic just for the fun of it. I guess sometimes. I give away way too much of my stinky personality today. <laughs> you mentioned you know, somebody cutting you off. And, you know, around here, I live in a rural area, thank goodness. But, I mean, if there's three cars on the road, that's a traffic jam as far as I'm concerned. It's like, hey, I'll get out of my way. But somebody cut me off not too long ago. And 
people started honking at this poor guy and you know, he gave me a filthy look and I went, what did I do to you? So he kept staring at me and I finally just blew him a kiss, drove him nuts. He did not like that. He knew I was being sardonic. <laughs> <laughs> I could have, you know, given him a finger ge- gesture, which is rude, yeah, or I blew him a kiss yeah. and he didn't know what to do with that. So <laughs> hopefully he, yeah. you know, had to sort it out while he drove in a better kinder manner we'll see who knows but sometimes being sardonic works you know I'm just telling you oh, okay yeah. and we can only be responsible for ourselves but that's exactly right he didn't hit me he didn't run into me he tried but he he missed you know so I just blew him a kiss and when I went about my business and forgot about it until you mentioned that so I guess it wasn't all that important to me my car was intact and I didn't get hurt okay so let's go back to some of the I'm sorry I'm feeling a little goofy today I apologize. So the, <laughs> the question that we, we brought up at the top is what do I need to know and how business owners can use it? What does that mean? So that means something different for everybody. Like what do I need to know should closely be tied with your particular goals. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later too, like the second half of goal setting. But um, when people come to me, they're like, uh, it depends on their situation. Uh, one woman came to me and she's like, what do I need to know in order to put $5,000 a month in my pocket? Because she wanted oh. to help. Yeah, that's what she, that's what she wanted. And that $5,000 meant something very, very personal to mm-hmm. her and her family. Okay. So that, that was her question. What do I need to know in order to, um, and, and again, it's future looking, um, some people are, what do I need to know in order to like make this feeling that comes with all of this debt go away? Like, what am I not seeing? Or what do I need to know to make it um, feel okay to invest in this program that I'm considering? Like, what are all the different angles? And I think as entrepreneurs, we are, we can be a very lonely group, right? And when it oh, comes yeah. to our business, sometimes we, we don't want to be talking to our family members and our friends because they just, they just don't get it. They're, we're a little bit of a different breed. We can be kind of hard on ourselves and we want to be able to come up with all the great ideas whenever we need the great idea. Um, and sometimes we discover things uh, later than we wish we had. Like our revenue, I, I am going to be a six-figure business and they turn around and they realize that, yep, with a six-figure business, I'm only putting $40,000 in my pocket. What the heck? <laughs> What's going on here? So yeah. then they come like, hang on a second. What do I need to know in order to get to this goal I set for myself? Because it certainly isn't what I thought it was going to be. What am I missing? Um, or what do I need to know to take a family vacation? It might be something even that simple or Hey, one was really heavy where she came to me and she was like, um, what do I need to know in order to see if my partner is stealing from the business? Oh, God. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so we get curious and sometimes we don't know how exactly to answer the questions. And um, we just need somebody who has a different angle. Somebody once told me, and I think this is a quote that comes from management at Coca-Cola, um, you, it's hard to read the label from inside the bottle. <laughs> Sometimes you need to not, not talk to somebody who knows how to read the label. See, sardonic. It works. I love sardon- sardonic people. <laughs> that made perfect sense to me. <laughs> and there's a difference between sarcasm, snarky, and sardonic, just so you all know. <laughs> okay, so oh, we have to amuse ourselves somehow. <laughs> I like amusing myself. Most of my day is spent amusing myself. Oh, listen, I often think I'm one of the funniest people I know, which is a good thing because I live alone. (laughs) It's a good thing I enjoy my own brain. So, sorry, we're both goofy today. This is fun. Okay, so what I need to know and how business owners can use it. So basically, I mean, we've covered that a bit, but is there anything else that – that has happened with some of your clients that you just went, okay, that's a new one. I have not seen that particular one. Or or is it just kind of, I don't want to call it general knowledge, but we all tend to kind of make the same mistakes in a bucket, I guess. 
Yeah, you know, the first time I came across fraud, I guess that was like, um, wow, I didn't, I didn't realize that people are actually, um, what's the right word? I don't want to say stupid, because she was certainly was not stupid. People are actually selfish enough or have been able to delude themselves enough in order to do this type of thing. Um, the biggest surprises for me come with, how the ideas of the clients they've been sitting on and waiting for somebody to give them permission to go forward with it. And Bingo. I actually come across it too. quite often. I see it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't, every time it surprised me that because the people that I meet they're they all have their brilliance and I'm always in awe of my clients is in terms of what they've come up with and how far they've gotten so far. And, and, I kind of sit back and a little bit of I stand girl <laughs> or my client sometimes. And then it does surprise me that these brilliant, brave, smart people are still waiting for permission. I'm like, oh, and sometimes that's the gift that they need is they just need me to say, yep, you're onto something. Go for it. Let's put a plan together and let's do this. So that's and where see, the surprises I- are coming these days. Yeah, and I see the same thing in in my clients, and I see the same thing in me. I I have been sitting on some really spectacular ideas, and the operative part of that sentence was sitting on. I'm starting to really tick myself off. Really. (laughs) Yeah, I have moments where I go, okay, go sit down. Go go, Go take a seat. You're going to have a talk with yourself. Because I really need to sort out, am I going to do this? Am I going to turn it over to somebody else and let them run with it? Because clearly I don't have the guts to do it. Or do I have the time? Do I have the money? There's always a reason. And I'm thinking, listening to you, that part of getting your money, and it's almost always money, isn't it? Part of getting your plan set, your money sorted out, is that you can take these brilliant ideas and actually put them Put them to work. Yeah, Without, I actually well, I can't have, afford that. I, can't, I mean, like right now, I need a new roof. I need new windows. I need a mailbox. I mean, when I say storms hit, they came to the front door. I'm not kidding you. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, but I also need to launch my podcast course. I need to let's say, oh, geez, well, which money is most important? The roof is pretty important, but insurance will take care of the biggest part of that. So we have to, as entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, business people, anybody, sit down and figure it out. And if we can't figure it out, I'm going to tell you right now, you need to hire somebody like Megan who can sort it out for you because the longer you wait, the digger that hole gets and the the more tired your soul becomes. Been there, done it, still doing it to some degree. If you keep ignoring your ideas and even they, they start to go away, Right, like they do, or somebody else does it, and you're like, "Yeah, I don't have to do it now." Right, right, yeah. Without feeding your ideas, even giving them the respect to write them down, so you could come back to them later, um, is good point. Can be really mm -hmm, inspiring for more ideas to keep coming. But if you keep getting ideas and keep ignoring them, eventually they're going to stop. They do, and it's really frustrating because you'll go back into your notebooks or your diary and go, oh, my gosh, why didn't I do that? So part of, if I'm hearing you correctly, and I think I am, a big part of goal setting and getting your money sorted out is the ability to clean out your brain because, let's face it, when we're worried about money, we're worried about anything, you know, Mm -hmm. whether it's our credit score, whether it's the IRS, whether it's paying for, you know, veterinarian bill, whatever it is, that kind of takes over and your creativity just kind of goes, I'll sit in the corner. Let me know when you need me. Yeah. Yeah. And so when it comes to the goal setting, um, there's a second half of it that people are missing. And that is the, the quantifying of the goals. And so I'll tell you a story. Way back when I was working a job that oh, it was a little bit soul sucking, um, the Powerball. I think you have Powerball down there, right? The Powerball oh, was oh, like at I have seven hundred million you, dollars. Yeah, I have to tell you before I forget. I made my power was gone for three days this time, and 
at some point I decided, well, it's probably going to be another three or four days. My generator's in the attic. I really planned this well. So I'm just at the point where my freezer is going to, I'm going to lose everything. So let me go see if I can find some ice. I knew better, but I needed to get out. The first place I went, it was closed, no change. The second place I went, they were open and you could buy stuff, but you had to pay cash. The, the, you had to go in and pay cash for your gas. You had to pay cash for everything. They couldn't run their, their little credit card machi- machines. And I'm stuttering. But, but only in Louisiana, you could buy a lottery ticket. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I just did it. I'm not often shocked. I was shocked. I'm still shocked. <laughs> oh, yeah, they got their priorities straight anyway. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. I'm sorry, I had to say that story because it's like, oh my God, you got to be kidding me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's fun to dream about. Um, so the power is sitting at like $700 million. And everybody in the office is like doing the pool, like, let's get a lottery ticket. Okay, fine, whatever. But I, I wanted to make a worksheet of what would happen if I won $700 million. So for like the next five <laughs> or six hours, I created this massive 20 tab worksheet that started all I had to do was plug in the, the Powerball, like the jackpot amount. It figured in like, well, if you take the sum, the total sum all at once, and then you take out the taxes, and then the amounts that I would give all of my family members and what I would use and what I would give away and you know, all these foundations I would start and da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, tab after tab after tab of where every cent of this jackpot would go. And ultimately, what it came down to, like the last tab was like, well, what would I even need for month to month to live on? And then the question was like, hang on a second what would I even do with my time? There's only so much time that I can spend like exactly. traveling. Like what in <laughs> this existential, what am I, who am I? And it came down to like, what would I still be doing? What would my perfect life look like if money was never, ever uh, uh, an issue and the goals would totally change except that the life wouldn't change all that much. I still would want to contribute. I'd still want to work somehow I'd have days where I would still want to sit and read or sit and create or sit and, um, you know, make new friends. So the actual day-to-day life was very similar. And the amount that I would need in order to do that, and when it comes down to money, wasn't all that much. And so I was able to quantify very specifically what my goal was for income and what my goal was for time and what my goals were for like, you know, mortgage payments or whatever, anything like that. And to put it into that perspective and to chunk it down into, oh my gosh, you know what? I'm not very far off from winning my own jackpot here. Um, Because I quantified how much I needed in my pocket in terms of these, these other goals over here. And I quantified when I would want to do it because one of the tabs was like a timeline, like day one, call a lawyer. <laughs> day two, <laughs> call an accountant. <laughs> day three, um, move and don't leave a forwarding address. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. And so putting a number on your goal and putting a date on your goal. And now we can back into how much cash do you need in your pocket by when? And now we can back into how much revenue does that mean generated in your business, taking into account all of the expenses and everything that you already have. Now, what is that number? And that can be super powerful in making people like see this is what needs to shift in my business or oof, this is a rough path that I'm hoeing for myself. Maybe, maybe we need a bigger shift. Maybe we need a different strategy. I've even had some clients that, that um, once we've set their goals and they back into their revenue number, they're like, oof, you know what? I was offered this part-time job for, you know, coaching for somebody else under somebody else. And I'm going to go take that while I'm still doing my side hustle over here. And so just because they could see it coming a year from now, but they just could not see it for themselves within the next three months. So like, okay, I'm going to go do this thing temporarily. That's going to give me a head start so I can come back and invest a little bit more in this marketing plan and, and, and then take a running start at it again. So um, it helps clients really face reality. 
at the same time of how do I make these goals tangible? Because goals don't just appear because you put them on a calendar, right? Like in three years, I would love to have this beautiful home on the prairie that has, you know, a Tesla in the garage with blah, da 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 No, it's not going to magically appear in three years because you put it on your vision board. It is going to appear once you quantify it, and now we're going to build the structures around protecting the progress towards it. So that you know when you go out and you make that big sale with that new website or you go land that new coaching client, you know when that money hits your bank account, you know exactly how much of it is going to be hidden from yourself as um, progress towards your goal. We're going to put it somewhere where it is just like where you can look at it and see it and like, ah, yes, I am taking steps. This is going to be real in three years because I'm protecting the progress that I'm making toward it. Exactly. So having a vision board is not a bad idea at all. But if you're just relying on a pretty picture of a big brick house or, you know, whatever it is, unless you are looking at that vision board and going, okay, I'm about a third there, and then keep on working. But you have to be able to look at that board and say, hmm, I'm not going to get there anytime soon, but how am I doing over on this side? It's, It's a visual. That's all it is. It's a visual. Yes. I once had a friend. She lives down south, and she grew up up here in South Dakota. And for years, for seven years, she said, we are going to move back home in three years. For seven years. Year one, she said, we're going to move back home in three years. Year two, she said, we're going to move back home in three years. Year seven, she's still saying, we're going to move back home in three years. Uh, She always had this image of herself in the future and never actually took the steps to make it a reality. Oh, gotcha. I asked her, like, well, what do you need to do in order to make that happen? Oh, you know, we want to pay down some debt a little bit. We want to, you know, do this and that. Um, But it was never set as, I'm going to do this. Okay, next month I'm going to pay off $400 of this debt. And by the end of the year, I should be able to pay off 4000 And then, yes, that is definitely three years away, and I'm going to hold myself accountable and make this, make this happen for myself. And I think we do that a lot when we set goals in our business is that, um, yes, I'm going to have this six-figure business. Yes, I'm going to have a seven-figure business. And then we don't have a, a way, a methodology of um, making sure it happens. Exactly. And, you know, she's been here this long. She might as well just call it home, I'm telling you. Um, yes. <laughs> you're stuck, my friend. <laughs> so you never get back. I don't know about you, Louisiana. You, there's you have to have a passport to get out of here, and if you get to Texas, you got three days of driving to get anywhere. So just stay where you're at. Okay. So oh man, I come for the food. Oh Louisiana, oh, yeah. the food is so good. Oh, I'm telling you. I mean, and people say, oh my God, you eat alligator? Oh yeah, it's so yummy. It just looks terrible, but it's really delicious. (laughs) I made gumbo yesterday. But you know, one of the one of the tricks that I did with with my money, and nobody taught me to do this. I just I knew that I had way too much in credit card debt. I was it was easy to spend when you have credit cards. It's just too easy. So what I did was I went to every one of my credit cards, and I didn't shut them down. But I put them on pause. You can't use them. If somebody gets a hold of them, they're not going to get anywhere because they're not mm-hmm. usable. And I started, you know, really upping the minimums. And once you use cash, and this is just my personal my personal experience, but if you're using a debit card or cash, you're going to think a little bit harder before you whip that card out because that's coming straight out of your bank account. So that's a bit of a deterrent, and it's been very, or it was, I still do it, but when I first started doing it, I was amazed how much money I didn't want to spend and how much money I was paying down, and I just did it kind of by accident. Oh, I like that. Yeah, when we attach something to our money like that, like um, if you're considering per investing in a new marketing platform, right, Like, and, and you understand that, okay. If I invest in this, if I pay the $500 this month for that, and you have a little blob, a colorful blob in your head that I've taught you to use, you're like, okay, that $500 actually equates to $4,000 in sales that I need Mm -hmm. to make up for. Because I only want to be spending X amount on marketing to make sure those blobs all stay the right size and shape and color. Um, Then it's like, okay, 
am I really going to get $4,000 out of this $500? And it lets you stop and think about what you're going to have to do with your time even to, to make it work. And you have to act, and you just said it. I was going to point that out. You have to actually work at it. You have to make it work. If you do go ahead and invest, and I invest a lot. I've invested a lot in my business, and some of it I didn't do. Some of it I, you know, worked with other people, and we all kind of went in on it because some of these programs are very expensive. So we have a buddy program going on there. Like, did you do it? No, but I will tonight. I promise. You know, you've got somebody nagging at you, or. As one friend said, I'm not nagging, I'm encouraging. No, you're nagging. <laughs> she was right, I was wrong. She was nagging, I was she was encouraging. But you know, you have to you have to actually say, I'm yeah, I'm gonna do this. It sounds great. The copywriters are lovely. I'm convinced. Take my money now. I love copywriters, don't get me wrong. But sometimes I'm like, You guys are too good for my good. Stop it. Yeah. But yeah. the thing is, once once you make that investment, you better darn well be ready to work it. And that, I think that's where a lot of that money fails. Yes, yes. And giving the skill set in order to think that through before you're whipping out your credit card and giving uh, them money, like that space. That yeah. space of, okay, hang on a second. Megan said that if I spend this amount, I need to make sure I have this much time on my calendar to make to fulfill it. So let's go look at my calendar and block it off for the next two months of this program. Oh, wait a second. Am I actually going to do that? No. Or, and that's ooh, a good, yeah. that's a great tip because if you can see it on your calendar and then all of a sudden you realize it's overlapping on other equally critical things. Mm-hmm. You're gonna go. Yeah. Uh, maybe this is not the time. Maybe I need to work my way through these other things first. Right. Right. Or maybe there's some easy money that I can pick up by cutting expenses elsewhere. What? And what yeah. can I? Like you said, you freeze your credit cards. Sometimes I just call them up and tell them to send me a new number, a new card altogether. I had to have that happen with Walmart. Somebody somehow got a hold of my Walmart card, which was turned off, and an $83 charge hit my bank. I called my bank and they reversed it. And that was the end of that. But at that point I said, send me another one, but turn it off. Don't turn it back on. So you have to keep, keep an eye on your bank account like every single day. But, but the thing is, once you shut those things down and you start seeing that those balances are coming down, you know, you're being a lot more, I don't know, you're, you're adverse now to just, you know, spending garbage money, just junk. I mean, look, and I I would tell this to everybody, look around your house, look in your garage, look in those drawers, look in the closets, look, I don't even want to look in the (laughs) attic. That used to be cash. That stuff used to be cash. What are you thinking? So don't do that anymore. (laughs) Don't do that. Don't do that. Some people are addicted to it. Some people don't know how to stop. Um, and sometimes it just takes another hand to say, hey, let me show you what you're actually doing to yourself. Let's, exactly. Let's put this that's in some terms that you can understand. Right, right. So we've only got about six more minutes, and we've chatted a good bit, mm-hmm. and I thoroughly enjoyed it. But what are what are some, some points that we haven't brought up um, that you really need for people to understand about their money, how to sleep at night, how to really look at those blobs? That you, I love that. You know, I <laughs> I work in blocks, you know, I put everything in containers and go, okay, that works. Um, But I love blobs. That's very creative. So let's (laughs) share anything that you think we have not touched on that is really important for people to hear today. Uh, You know, a lot of people think that financial statements are the be all and end all of knowing your numbers. In reality, they're not. Um, They're a great starting point, right? Like that's great. I'll look at your financial statements, but What gives people the most clarity far and above your financial statements, like your income statement and balance sheet, is your cash forecast. Like being able to see where you're going to be 90 days from now or even six months from now um, is amazing. And you can go back through by week or even by month and see where the low points are and where the high points are, and now you can say, oh, wait, I always have enough cash that I probably could be giving me myself a raise, or, oh, in three months from now, that's my dry season, and I see that I'm going to be in the hole about $2,000. How can I make sure that I'm not in the hole $2,000? 
And if I am, like, what's the plan now? So I'm not putting that on credit cards or I'm not getting high interest debt in order to cover that. What do I do now? So, I mean, financial statements are great. Don't get me wrong. It gives you the, the health of your business. It shows you, you know, what's happened. Um, but nobody ever gets their income statement, looks at that last number, and is completely surprised by what's there. People have a sense for what their financial statements are going to tell them. It's what they can predict in the future that eradicates their procrastination. It gives them absolute clarity on what they should be working on that's right in front of them. And it's a really powerful tool that I cannot encourage people hard enough to take a look at your cash forecast for the next 90 days to six months. Um, It's going to really give you some insight as to what to do right now. No kidding. So we're in the middle or the end. I don't know where we are with this pandemic. Truthfully, I'll tell you what I think the pandemic is. I think it's media. I think we're scared to death on a regular basis, you know, if we're paying attention to it. And of course we have to pay attention to it. So that worries us. You know, we're, it seems to me like as a populace here and other countries as well, we're all experiencing or living under what I would call a low level sense of dread makes things worse. You don't really know what you're looking at. You don't mm. know where you should go. It's it's very frightening. So my point, and I do have a point, I promise, I think I do. <laughs> my, my point is that, you know, things are changing. And, and I hate the word pivot. I hate it. I hate it. I would rather use the word <laughs> adapt. You know, we can look at things like you're doing with the, this cash, you know, with, with your forecasting and say, okay, let's adapt. What do we have now? What are we going to have then? But things are changing so, so quickly. You may not have a job. You may not have a client in three to six months. So where can people, you know, in this this document or these questions that you're asking, where do they go to say, okay, what if I lose my best client? What if I have a client who says, I can only afford to pay half. We need to cut hours. You know, there are so many what ifs. What do, what do we do then? I mean, where can you go to get a measure of confidence that you've got this, you can handle it? Well, those are actually great questions that I love to put on the cash forecast. Like, this is what's going to happen if things just stay steady as she blows. This is what's going to happen if things turn out great. And this is what's going to happen if things are terrible. Like, right when COVID hit, I did have a client, and she was like, show me the worst case scenario. And so we went through the worst case scenario, and I said, oh, right, because it was a restaurant. And I said, you have a choice. Because, frankly, I think worst case scenario is the most realistic scenario. And she's like, I want close to serve down. my community. Right. And she was like, I know it's going to be cheaper to close it down, but I want to be in my community and serving my community, and I'm willing to do that until X date. And by X date, if we've lost this much, I'll close it down. And if by X date that we haven't and we've only lost this much, I'm going to keep on going until we've lost that, that floor amount, right? So she could see it. She took her head out of the sand. She looked up and she saw the train coming down the tracks so she could start going in the other direction. Um, I don't know if this analogy is going to work without, I like, talk with my hands a lot. So I do too. I, <laughs> I think we're sisters. <laughs> so being able to see what's coming down the track so you can give yourself a wider gap, like, oh, that's two weeks away. What can I do to make that three weeks away? Okay, I've accomplished getting enough cash to make that, that, that event, that terrible event, three weeks away. Now how can I make it four weeks away? And just giving yourself more and more space while you're still looking for the train, what is it, when's it coming, what's it carrying, when's it going to hit me? But sometimes the answer is so much, even if the answer is, ugh, I'm going to have to fire somebody in six months or I'm going to have to furlough some employees in two months. Thank goodness you know that answer now and not in two months. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> so you can start planning for that right and now. Exactly. And I've seen some restaurants who have just done remarkable work in their communities by saying, okay, we don't have a drive through but, you know, we can bring it out to your car. We've, we've got restaurants here that did that. So I thought it was brilliant. They didn't close down. They didn't cower. They said, we're going to make it work. What do you need from us? They talked with their their customers and found out that customers are happy to, you know, order online or order by phone or even through Facebook for, you know, 
which is one way of doing it, and then drive up, call and say, I'm out here. I'm in the Silver Range Rover. Bring me my my stuff. It works. Mm -hmm. It works. And they're still in business. The people who didn't kind of figure out how to serve their community or their, their clients, consumers, they're out of business. And that's sad. That's so, yeah. so sad. It's sad. Yeah. That's rough. That's rough. Um, it is. Uh, yeah. And being able to see that coming down the road and making the plans for it, um, the answer might be that you're, you're still going to want to throw spaghetti, but man, I promise you it's easier to sleep at night when you can see it than when you're coming up two weeks ahead of it and you're like, uh, what do I do now? What do I do now? What do I do now? And that's really what we're talking about today. You have to be able to see it or at least peer into the abyss and kind of get an <laughs> idea of what's coming. And it's so it's more important now, I think, than ever. Megan, we we just ran out of time. I can't believe that oh was goodness. 16 <laughs> minutes. Where can, is there anything else you want to share with the audience and then tell people where they can find you? Um, I have your back. You know, there's somebody out there that has your back of whatever it is that is on your mind and your heart about your business. Um, I'm an open ear. I'd love to talk to you. Um, and you can make an appointment with me. I'll talk to anybody <laughs> over at MeganDolly.com. Spell Dolly for me. Oh, it's D-A-H-L-E. Right. So it's M-E-G-A-N-D-A-H-L-E.com. Dot com. Yep. Gotcha. Okay, Megan, thank you. It has been wonderful chatting with you and kind of being goofy a little bit, which <laughs> I'll tell you, after all the stuff around here, I needed somebody as goofy as me sometimes to just talk with. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate oh, your sense pleasure. of humor. I, oh, thank you. And, I mean, with your sense of humor and the wonderful tips and advice that you've shared, I've had a terrific time chatting with you. So before we say goodbye, I would like to remind our audience to be sure to look for us in iTunes and really anywhere else you consume your business podcast. I found out recently that... You can now find your partner in Success Radio on Amazon Prime Places. I was so proud of myself. So just look for your partner in Success Radio and take us along on your success journey. Megan, thank you. Thank you, Denise. This was so fun. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab. 